Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. And today we're starting a five-part series we're going to do over on the Big Blue Banter podcast and YouTube show, which will be the five biggest burning questions facing the Giants heading into the offseason. We decided to break this up into five parts so we can really extend and discuss all of these different burning questions facing the Giants. And we're going to go part one through part five with part one coming first um, in order, I think, of at least how Nick and I view it to be importance. And so without obvious further ado, the first one we're going to address is biggest question facing the Giants this offseason, how to address the quarterback position. Now, that just doesn't mean we're going to sit here and say the Giants need to draft a quarterback. We're going to look at all the different angles, including what the Giants decide to do with Daniel Jones's contract, Nick. So that's where I want to start today. What the Giants are going to do with Daniel Jones' contract this offseason, to me, will say a lot about their future plans and how they currently view Daniel Jones. Now, I know a lot of people have said, look, the Giants resigned Daniel Jones last offseason. Yes, they had an out in his contract after two years, but they resigned him for a reason. They projected him to be their starting franchise quarterback for the next four years if things go right and according to plan. Why would they use six games of film with a bad old line situation? Um to make any changes to that. And I think that's fair if you believe that the situation was so unbelievably bad that you cannot determine anything on Jones's play based on his tape because of it. You can't look at the Seattle game. You can't look at any of those games. But what I'm not sure that addresses, Nick, is the injury situation. Could that have provided new information for Joe Shane and Brian Dable as far as what they want to do with their future. General Jones, another neck injury, came back after a couple games, but it's a neck injury. Then tore his ACL, an athletic-based quarterback, tore his ACL, and now has surgery from a torn ACL. Will that information change their decision? I'm not sure, Nick, but I know one thing for sure, Nick, and I want to start here and get your opinion on this. If the Giants do decide to restructure Jones's contract for the second time, because this is something not everybody knows, by the way, Nick, I want to point this out. On September Here's the day. On September 4th of 2023, the Giants converted 8 point that was last season just before the season opener, Nick. The Giants converted 8.42 million of his 2023 base salary into a signing bonus to clear 6.31 million of cap space. What did that do, Nick? It allowed the Giants to make in-season signings. It allowed Giants some flexibility. What did it also do? It set Jones up, Nick, for having just a 15.4 million dollar cap hit in 2023. What does that mean? We obviously know he signed a four-year 160. That's about 40 million AAV. What does that mean? It means bigger cap hits down the line. Jones will have a $47 million cap hit in 2024, a $58 million cap hit in 2026, and a $41 million cap hit in 2025. So, Nick, if they decide to restructure this contract again, what that will do is create cap space for this coming offseason to add players and talent around Jones while pushing back further cap hit to the 2025 and 2026 season on Jones's contract. To me, Nick, that says with certainty that the Giants are trying to build to win now, improve the roster, and at that point, I believe that that will be them telling us that they think Daniel Jones is the quarterback of the future. That's my opinion. I'm curious where you stand on that. Yeah, Dan, if they kick it down the line even more, 26-year-old quarterback, at the end of this contract, he would be 29. He has all these injuries. There are traits that he hasn't consistently shown yet on the football field. And this guy was a rookie back in 2019. Kind of know who Daniel Jones is at this point. But if they want to kick it down the line, I think you're saying, yes, we are going to build and Daniel Jones is our guy. But they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You just gave this guy this contract. He's had a list of injuries throughout his career, and now he just tore his ACL. Like you said, he is a mobile quarterback. What are you going to do in this situation? I think the only thing that you, you can do right now is either find a rookie who can compete with him, rip the Band-Aid off, you're going to eat that dead cap when it becomes feasible. You can't do that next season, or you do grow with him moving forward because you did give him this contract, which, I mean, let's be honest. If you put Joe Shane in a chair right now, Dan, and you said you could redo that deal and not give it to him, what do you think he would say? I hope he would say no, but I think this offseason will be telling if he would say no, because I think it's fair to consider, Nick, what other the other side says, which is why would the Giants give that contract out to Daniel Jones and then after six games with that offensive line decide, eh, we changed our mind. The only thing that would be 
maybe a reason to do that would be the injury situation, the ACL, the surgery, the second neck injury. But other than that, those people might have a point when they say, look, they didn't sign him to just eat the dead cap and rip the Band-Aid off in year two. No, of course they didn't sign him to do that. But we also expected a jump in play when the Giants went all in for the 2023 season. How many times as a general manager and a coach are you going to have the opportunity to go all in? Right. Like you need to sit down with John Mayer, who loves Daniel Jones, and have a serious conversation about what you're going to do with your future. And if it is Daniel Jones, best of luck. But you can sit John Mara down if you're the general manager and be like, look, we should start investigating other options at the quarterback position with Brian Dable as our coach to see if we can find lightning in a bottle and just to create competition. Look, we won three games this season, and I get the competition wasn't all that great. We won three games this season with a rookie undrafted guy. If we make a significant, and it doesn't even have to be a first round pick. It doesn't have to be at six. It doesn't have to be a trade up. I think all of those should be explored though. If you make a second round pick on a quarterback who has some traits and Daniel Jones isn't fully healthy and Daniel Jones doesn't take to the rehab as well, or if his game does not take another step in his development, now you have at least a contingency plan in place behind Daniel Jones. And you don't have to be fired as a general manager. You don't have to be fired as the coach. I think you have to explore that no. I think you do have to explore that. I mean, not only did they win three games with DeVito, they won just as many games with DeVito, more games with DeVito and Taylor, right? Than they won with Daniel Jones this year. And those guys had fewer starts than Daniel Jones. So they won more games with fewer starts. Now they had Andrew Thomas in the game yes. and injured Andrew Thomas. They also didn't have Leonard Williams and Jones had Leonard Williams. So we can't, we can go tit for tat. And I know Thomas is way more important than Williams. I get it, but it's not the giants didn't win those games just because Andrew Thomas was out there. There were other reasons. And it's not just because it was a quarterback other than Jones, but the point being, we shouldn't be able to compare those things. Those are not what you want to compare for $47 million cap it. And we know that Nick, but for me, the interesting discussion becomes what do you tell John Mara or, you know, what do you tell the fan base? Because if you say, you know, I think both of you and I, I don't want to speak for you, Nick, but my take is I want to rip the bandaid off clean. I don't want any further restructuring of this Jones contract. I do not want any more dead cap pushback. The giants are already have a lot of dead cap coming likely on the Daniel Jones contract. Unless of course he plays through the contract, right? So this year, so much dead cap, they can't even cut him. We know that. But year after next year is where they're out is in 2025. And even when they get out of the contract, if they get out of the contract after this coming season, there's still 22 million in dead cap coming for the 2025 season. That number actually, Nick, can rise significantly to 35 million in dead cap if Jones gets a season ending injury next year while playing, requires surgery, and is not ready for the 2025 March new new league year. Then there's an injury guarantee that his agent worked into contract. Yes. So now turn it to 35. But if you restructure the contract again this offseason to create cap space, let's say you restructure it so you kick $10 million in cap space down the line. That's another $10 million you add. I'd rather rip the Band-Aid off of what I consider to be a mistake at this point, to be completely yes. honest. I was swayed by his season last year. I tried to look for the best and the hope and the optimism, but I'm done with that. I'm no longer doing that. You can be dislike that opinion of mine. It's fine. It's my opinion. I do not want to go forward with Daniel Jones anymore at this cap hit. If they want to resign him down the line for six, eight million, like Tyrod Taylor in a few years, if he fizzles out with another team, whatever, I'm open to that. But at $47 million cap hit and whatever it's going to be, I'm completely out at the Giants having any chance at a Super Bowl with that kind of cap hit for this kind of player. So, I want to get out of this as fast as possible, as smoothly as possible, and as clean as possible. I don't want to add another $10 million in dead cap to future years just to create cap space. But, Nick, that's what I want to do. That's what you want to do. But that's a harder sell for Joe Shane, right? If you yes. come to John Mayer and you say, hey, John, I know we look at the 2022 season. I know we look at the 2023 season. And I'm not telling you anything groundbreaking, John, but we don't really have the best roster outside. Don't even think about quarterback for a second. We got a lot of needs outside quarterback. How do we fix those needs in free agency? Like a great guard or another corner or all the different things the Giants need. Resigning Xavier McKinney. We do it by restructuring contracts. Okay, let's start with Andrew Thomas. Let's start with Dexter Lawrence because we know those guys are going to be here long term, barring injuries. So we start to do those. Boo, we get Lawrence. We get, you know, we get, um, 
we get Lawrence, we get Thomas. There may be another one in there that I'm blanking on. Who someone brought them him up to me today? Another restructure that's possible. Um, uh, Bobby Okereke, you can restructure Bobby Okereke's deal, kick some dead cap hit back on that one as well. But you still may need more cap room if you're Joe Shane when you come to John Mayer with your offseason plan because John's going to want them to improve for the 2024 season. He doesn't want to go into 2024 as a dead season where the Giants are just not competitive and not able to improve on the product they put out in 2023 or the product they put out in 2022, to be quite frank. He's going to want improvements. And the next way to do that, Nick, is the only other contract they can really restructure, Daniel Jones. Jones's contract. And that's when it comes into play because to me, and, and I, and I just heard it from you, but I, I don't want them to go that route. I personally am fine. I hate to say it, but if they can't get a quarterback this off season, I'm fine. Just treating the 2024 season as look, it is what it is. I I'd rather, so I, it's not that I want to give up on a season, Nick. It's just that I don't want to mortgage more of their future to a player that I don't think has any real future with this team just to get a little bit better in 2024 when I know that there's no real Super Bowl ceiling in 2024. I don't care how much. You can restructure all of Jones' contract, right, Nick? You can drop that cap bit all the way down to $15 million, push back $40 million in dead cap to 2025, 2026, and use that $30 million in free agency. And guess what? I still don't think this team is competing for a Super Bowl next year, even if you did all of that. So why am I mortgaging any of the future to try to get that contract, uh, to try to improve the team is what is where I'm at personally. I'm right there with you too. And yeah. you know what? You can treat 2024 if Daniel Jones is ready as <laughs> it sucks to say this, but kind of like another, another 2022 type season. Like, sure. look, we have you under contract. We can cut you 22 million in dead cap. Kenny Galladay, I think was like what? 14 and a half, 15 million dead cap. So it's doable. You can eat that much dead cap. If the giants do decide to part ways with Daniel Jones during or before the 2025 season, after this upcoming season, and then have Daniel Jones go out there in 2024 when he is healthy and try to prove it to stay on the roster for 2025. But I think if you're Joe Shane, if you're Brian Dable, and if you're the New York giants organization, you need to find the contingency plan. If Daniel Jones does not accomplish, those things and you should not mortgage the future by kicking more of the cap can down i am right there with you look if this is a lose it type of year in 2024 no one wants to sign up for that you don't if your ownership want to sell psls with that as your reality but if you want to compete for super bowls later in 2025 and 2026 and 2027 right. you need to have a contingency plan you can't have all your chips in the daniel jones basket any longer we made that mistake last year if he can prove himself again in 2025 all well and good he's already under contract you don't have to give him another contract but let's not rely on that long term because like you said you're just mortgaging your future and you're shooting yourself in the foot if it does not materialize and it hasn't materialized since 2019 we had one good season with brian dable and everything went well for the new york giants i don't think we should expect that to happen moving forward yeah that's fair and, and you know what nick it's really interesting because we did this already. We've gone through this know, already. Man, we didn't rip the Band-Aid off with the past GMs, right? With Eli, we kept pushing that cap hit back. We kept trying to build around him. Gettleman took Barkley at number two overall. Even I would argue that didn't even, that didn't even give him a good chance to succeed. If I was the GM there, I'd say, if I want to win now, I'll put an O-line here. I don't need a running back. I'll put an O-line. But he did that. He tried. He tried. Pushed the cap hits back. We've done a lot of this like half-assed rebuilding for a while now, Nick. We've done this all the time. With competitive cap rebuilding is what competitive it's Competitive rebuilding, right? But at some point, do you look yourself in the mirror and you say, what's more important, trying to get better each and every year or trying to get better long-term? And is the answer to trying to get better long-term to continue to try to get better each and every year? Or is there another route? Is that other route to create enough flexibility for yourself down the line by not restructuring, by not kicking cap hits back on players like Jones, who have had injury histories and really poor play on film by all objective analysis outside of the Giants? We're the ones who are saying it's poor on film and we're covering the Giants. What do you think the people who cover the 31 other teams are saying about this? Because they go look up their opinions. They're nothing like what you expect them to be regarding yeah. this quarterback. And then you hear Sam, uh, Seattle defensive back saying, we watch the tape. All he does is stare down his first read, throws first read, then pick six. You're San Francisco defensive back saying, we watch the tape. We knew from the first snap he wasn't throwing deep. We just sit on every route. And then you see it on the film. And this is what other teams and players and analysts are saying. 
So why do you want to keep kicking that cap hit back? The other thing, Nick, is if they don't go the route of trying to improve now by restructuring Jones and, and going heavy in free agency again, or even just heavy in the sense of getting another Okereke, that's a big splash. Not every team signs an Okereke every offseason, and that wasn't their only signing, H. John Robinson. But even if they don't go that direction, Nick, and they just say, you know what? It's a rebuilding year for us, right? Like, there's a lot of teams that have rebuilt. It's a rebuilding year for us. And by the way, when you do that, Nick, you don't even guarantee you're not going to have success. The Rams did not do anything major in free agency this offseason. They lost Ashawn Robinson, among other players. They traded Jalen Ramsey. How did they rebuild so fast? They did it by crushing the draft. They crushed the draft. Puka Nakua, the Kobe Turner, all those picks, and by hiring the right offensive line coach to turn that offensive line around like this. That's and, and they landed a couple of and and what? And they have Matt Stafford. And they had Stafford come back, obviously. That was Huge. that was a big one. But they were still yeah. expected to be a rebuilding team this year. The Rams were not expected to make the playoffs. They didn't do anything in free agency. They were just expected to be the second or third worst team in the NFL by record. I think everybody underrated Stafford in that and the importance of having Stafford. That's fine. But they still made it work despite not mortgaging their future by getting through free agency now. That's the path I want the Giants on at this point. I'm not looking at 2024 as, oh, let's keep trying to build around Jones. And you know what, Nick? Honestly, it's almost better if they don't. As far as looking at the second point you made about this being a proven year for Jones, it's almost better if they don't. Because they put if they put all this stuff around him and they hit on everything, then are we really going to know if it's him or if it's all the stuff around him? Or if they make him try to bring, you know, prove himself out of adversity here and really rise above the level, like you kind of made Matt Stafford do, right? You didn't give Stafford any linemen. You gave him a good line coach. We've probably done that. You didn't give Stafford any free agents, but you drafted well. Maybe we can draft well. Maybe then Jones can prove it. But I don't want to mortgage the future now just under the assumption that Jones can definitely prove it. Of course. Now, if Daniel Jones comes out in 2024, say he's healthy for week one, or even if he misses the first couple weeks, whatever. He comes in and say they start winning football games. I think it's because he's adjusted his game. And yes. I know it's going to be difficult while he's in rehab, but the, the book is out on Jones, as you just laid out. Everyone knows what Daniel Jones does and how he has had success with Mike Kafka and Brian Dable. If he comes out there and starts winning games, it's probably because he's creating explosive plays. It's probably because he developed the counterpunch, and that's what Daniel Jones lacks. Has no counterpunch. He can throw the jab. He can throw the jab. Maybe he'll hit you with a cross with his legs, right? But can he hit you with that uppercut? Can he catch you when you get your guard down? That's what Daniel Jones lacks, and that's what he needs. But at this point, we as Giant fans and Giants organization, their brass, they shouldn't rely on him developing that counterpunch. They should find another prospect or another quarterback who has a counterpunch already or who can develop that counterpunch and doesn't have, you know, five years of not developing it under his belt, five, six years. That's a great point. And he will have that opportunity. And if he proves that, then that's when you start to restructure the next offseason, right? Nick, you do it in 2025 after the good 2024. You don't do it now before it happens. You wait. Then you start mortgaging. And all that makes sense to people like you and me, Nick. But it's a tougher sell for Joe Shane. Because here's what Joe Shane's telling John Mara. You just allocated $160 million of your own money to this player. And we want to tell you right away that we don't really see a future in him. So we don't want to restructure any more of that contract. We don't want to push any more of that cap hit back. And we don't want to build around him this year in free agency. We want to look at this free agency as a true rebuilding year where you don't allocate assets into this year. That's a tough sell for John Mara, especially when you know John Mara in his mind is dead set on 0% of why Daniel Jones has been unproductive is because of him. It's 100% our fault. He's even said it himself. He said, we failed Daniel Jones. Now, I always have contention with that take, Nick, because I think it's very disingenuous by anyone who says it because it's assuming that if Jones had everything around him, he would be elite. It's also assuming that he has no role in this and he's played no part in this, which is insanity to me, given his tape in college. And given everything I know about him on tape already, because you and I, we watch the tape to try to evaluate players independent of their cast. We do that with every other player. Why can't we do that with the quarterback position? We should be able to. But that's not how Mara views this. Mara views it as we need to keep trying, build around, build around, build around, get him this, get him that, get him this, get him that. Because that's when we can say that he failed us rather than we failed him. And that's going to be a point of contention between them if Shane wants to take this route of ripping the Band-Aid off and really, truly viewing this as a rebuild year. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. 
instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Oh, my friends, you know what time it is. You're hungry, you're starving, and you desperately need pizza. You should get the best pizza on the market. And that is, of course, Little Caesars. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. Order online during the Pizza Pizza pregame all day on NFL game days and even on Pro Bowl Sunday and get ready for some football fun and cheesy delicious pizza. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. Now, this is a little bit of a side tangent, but I wonder, after John Mara made that comment, what was the impetus to that comment what was the primary reason he wanted to make that comment was it because of the offensive line or was it because they hired jason garrett as the offensive coordinator in the second year of daniel jones's career and we know that john mara has spoken very highly of jason garrett before jason garrett was the offensive coordinator and i would imagine he may have had a say in joe judge selecting jason garrett as his offensive coordinator this is me just spitballing right here But if that is the fact, then John Mayer really needs to look in the mirror and be like, I just need to shut the f- up and let Joe Shane do his <laughs> thing. We're eating this money right now. I don't love that. I do like Daniel Jones. But maybe he felt bad for suggesting, maybe strongly suggesting, Jason Garrett as the offensive coordinator saw two years or a year and a half of anemic offense. True. The Giants were among the worst in the league when Jason Garrett was the offensive coordinator. He's like, you know what? That sucks. And then he felt bad about firing Joe Judge because of it. He's like, I know there's a good coach in there. Maybe John Mara was the cause of a lot of the recent problems. And I'm not even a big John Mara hater like a lot of people Me on either. Giants Twitter are. I'm not. I think John Mara spends money, and I absolutely love that. I couldn't imagine being like the Cincinnati Bengals or something or a team that just doesn't really spend that much money. Right. And doesn't really, uh, you know, give their franchise a lot of chance. Like I think John Mayer does, but it doesn't mean he doesn't meddle. It doesn't mean he doesn't have his say in in personnel, maybe. And I know he loved Jason Garrett, and that was a, just an absolute disaster, Dan. So maybe there's something there. I like that theory. And first, let me apologize again to all the listeners and view more more than more so the viewers. I am sick while recording this, so I'm sniffling a bunch and blowing my nose and, and coughing. I apologize for that. Nothing I can do on that front. But it's an interesting theory, Nick. Yeah, what Nick over there. I'm lucky I'm not recording this live with Nick because I think we'd be in another room right now. Oh, of course, um, man. I ain't gonna hang out with your sick ass. <laughs> yeah, you know, I ain't gonna hang out with anybody sick. Um, and I don't blame you for that. Nothing worse than when somebody gets you sick. It's okay. I just literally was supposed to hang out with my parents yesterday and watch the games and I canceled them because I didn't want to potentially get them sick. But I don't have COVID. I checked that already. So that's good. Um, But on your theory, it's an interesting one, Nick, because John Merritt, from all accounts, did play a role in the Jason Garrett hire. And I don't necessarily know if this is true, but I would imagine he played a little bit of a role in bringing back Jason Garrett. You remember when Gettleman said, we value continuity. We don't want Daniel Jones to have to learn a new system, which you and I disagreed with from the very start. We said it's way more important to get a good offensive coordinator in here than to get continuity just because a guy's done it already. and He doesn't have to learn a new system for your quarterback. doesn't mean that's a good thing. It's a failed broken system. And so that could also be weighing on John Mara. I don't know. But what I do know is John Mara via his comments has not made it clear to me, at least that he thinks Daniel Jones deserves any of the blame for the lack of production and the bad tape in the first five years. 
in my opinion, he believes it's all on the Giants, or mostly, if not all, on the Giants and the way they developed around him. But again, I just have issue with that because I don't think it takes into account anything we saw on tape at Duke, and I don't think it gives the actual individual enough responsibility in this case. We would never say that about a D-line. We would never say that about an O-line. We would never say that about a corner, receiver, or anyone. Why are we saying that about a quarterback? So I think we have to look at, now that we've laid this case out, I think you and I, we... We have opinions on this, if it's not obvious. Has there been a precedent set by other NFL teams where they signed a quarterback to a contract similar to Daniel Jones and then quickly realized maybe that wasn't the best decision to make? Maybe we should go in another direction or at least explore it. The team that comes to mind for me kind of happened twice in the last decade now. Wasn't nearly as much money with the first guy we're going to go over that Daniel Jones is earning. But remember when the Eagles signed Sam Bradford? They signed Sam Bradford in 2016 to, I think it was like a $26 million guaranteed, but it was, uh, I think, $36 million in two years, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have it yes. right in front of me. But they did that. And after one year, and Sam Bradford was never going to be the long-term solution at this point. He had been in the league for about six years, has been on multiple teams. They realized they needed to draft somebody else. So after giving that contract, they traded up in the draft to get Carson Wentz. I have a bug flying in my face. Sorry for the YouTube. So they said, yeah, we have Sam Bradford, this veteran who we like, but let's upgrade. And they went and they got Carson Wentz. And then a couple years later, they gave Carson Wentz a significant contract. They signed him in 2019 to a $128 million contract for four years with $107 million guaranteed. And this is much more relatable to Daniel Jones, only with more guaranteed money. Shortly after, the next season, in the second round, they drafted Jalen Hurts. And by the end of that season, it was very clear that Carson Wentz was no longer going to be a thing, a year removed from giving him a massive contract. And those are the those are the primary precedents that come to my mind, mainly the Carson yeah. Wentz one, but I felt like the Sam Bradford one was also uh, interesting just because it was the same franchise and it maybe it helped lead to the decision-making behind selecting a guy like Jalen Hurts to overtake Carson Wentz after they realized they may have made a mistake. Well, this takes us, Nick, to the, the next point of addressing this burning question, asking, or, uh, you know, facing the Giants, like how do they address the quarterback position? Because the first point is, do they restructure Jones and do they build around Jones and and put everything into 2024? You know, because they went pretty all in on 2023 from a they cap did. standpoint. Do they do it again in 2024? The second question becomes, if they do make the decision, if they don't do that and they make the decision that we want to truly choose this as a rebuilding year, no more restructuring Jones. Do they make the decision to move on from Jones and or do they keep the decision as, you know, we'll have an expensive backup at least for 2024 uh, at the very minimum. And then we'll see what happens 2025, because if they make the decision, what you're talking about and going down that route, the question becomes, is this a tradable contract? I am of the belief that this is not a tradable contract. And I want to make that clear right now. Oh, uh, unless what the Giants take on a bunch of cap hit. Unless Brock Osweiler. Well, then that's the other thing that you can. Yes. Okay. So th not everybody knows. I want to talk about the Wentz examples and the Bradford examples gotcha. too. So I want to come back to that, but so let's do the Brock Osweiler trade. Brock Osweiler trade is Brock Osweiler comes in for an injured Peyton Manning with the Broncos has a pretty good stretch of football. Then obviously Peyton comes back, comes in the playoffs and Brock Osweiler is a free agent that off season. So the Houston Texans signed him to uh, what was it, a three year, $72 million contract, Nick. Four year, seventy four year, seventy two million dollar contract. So that's a little bit over what sixteen, seventeen million against the cap uh, per year AAV. And Osweiler was so bad, and they realized the decision was so bad, they trade him ultimately the Texans to the Moneyball Cleveland Browns, who are at that time run by a Moneyball guy in their front office. Um, and the Browns actually. Just to take on that contract, they receive a second round pick from the Texans. Texans trade their second round pick, get nothing in return, and Brock Osweiler just to get rid of that contract. The Browns are in money ball mode. They're not even trying to win right now. They're like, oh, we'll take on this crappy contract. We get a free second round pick. Come on, give it our way, send it our way. Now, the differences between that and Jones is that was only 17 million against the cap. Jones, if you want to trade him now, the Giants have already restructured that contract once. You're talking about 40 million plus against the cap to any team that would trade for Jones. Now, is Jones a much better player than Brock Osler was? Hell yeah, he is. Jones actually won a playoff game. Jones uh had a pretty good season in 2022 from an EPA standpoint, had 22 total touchdowns, only one interception. Um, you know, much better player, but also 40 million against the cap versus 17 million against the cap. 
And Jones has a torn ACL now. And Jones has two neck injuries now. Everyone just assumes that teams are willing to trade for Daniel Jones. But I never know what that assumption is based on, Nick. Because every time I hear analysts from other teams or players from other teams, they all speak lowly of Daniel Jones. And I don't know why Giants fans assume this is just a contract you can trade or that someone would be interested in trading for him. In my mind, if you're an NFL team and you're rebuilding or you're trying to win now, you're certainly not trying to do it with Daniel Jones. If you're trying to win now, you go after the Kirk Cousins of the world. If you're trying to rebuild, you spend the money on a rookie quarterback contract and you draft a rookie. Even if you can't get one in round one, you take one in round two, and he only counts against 800000 against your cap. Why in the world would you trade for a $40 million Jones contract coming off a torn ACL with now two neck injuries? You wouldn't. And it's all fan fiction to me whenever I hear it. That one I'm strong about, Nick, and it really bothers me when people say that that contract can be traded because they say it based on nothing. There's no evidence to suggest it. People are like, oh, I think this guy said he liked Jones back in the 2019 draft. No one said that. That's a report. That's a rumor. No no one's inside those draft rooms. No one knows what any of those GMs felt about Jones then. No one knows what any of these GMs feel about Jones now. No one knows any of this. It's all speculation. And all we can go on, Nick, is the evidence and the facts. And the facts are that's a bad contract that uh, for a guy who's injured. Why would anyone trade for that? Why in the world would anyone trade for that? So to me, that route, I, I rule it completely out. I don't think that's going to happen at all. I don't think the Giants are going to trade Jones at all. But, Nick, if they want to go the route of – Re, of, of moving on past him, like you said, with the Eagles, with Jalen Hurd. I'm sorry, but yeah, Jalen Hurts from Wentz and Bradford from for, uh, to Wentz. Sorry, I, I got a little confused there. That is the different route because that you can still do because when the Eagles went to Jalen Hurts, Nick, they traded that Carson Wentz contract and obviously they were able to get a better pick than people expected because Ridiculous. yeah, it was a horrible trade by the Colts, but at least Carson Wentz had an MVP season under his belt. You can't compare that to – you can't look at that and say, hey, wait a second, the Eagles got all this from the Colts. Can't the Giants get all this from trading uh, – I'm sorry, from the Colts for trading Carson Wentz? Can't the Giants get all this from trading Daniel Jones? No. One, the NFL learned from how bad that trade was, and they're not going to repeat how bad that trade was. How do I know that? Well, the NFL hasn't signed another Deshaun Watson-like contract since that crappy contract went out with all the guarantee money. Two – Carson Wentz had an MVP season. Daniel Jones hasn't even come anywhere close to being MVP in a regular season. Hasn't even sniffed the consideration of MVP in a regular season. So that's not comparable at all. No one is going to do that. So if you want to move on, though, like the Eagles did, Nick, the Eagles still had to take on a lot of Carson Wentz's dead cap after making that trade, as I know you remember. But yeah, Nick, Nick, there is precedence to them potentially moving on from that contract or just viewing it as moving forward with a different quarterback while still having the Jones contract under the situation uh, under the Giants salary construction, because look, they're not they can't cut him. We know that already based on the salary cap. It's all dead. And I don't think they can trade him personally. So he will still be under contract, but that doesn't mean you can't make the decision like the Eagles did in a lot of ways to move forward to a new quarterback like they did with Jalen Hurts. And that would be via the draft. I think that's the first avenue we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about free agency as well after it. But let's first talk about the avenue via the draft because Joe Shane told us, what, two, three months ago that, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm aware of what the roster looks like and Tyrod Taylor's a free agent. So, we will do something to address quarterback this offseason. He didn't say if it was the draft or free agency. Let's look at the draft first, though, Nick, because the draft is the area where if the Giants were trying to upgrade over Daniel Jones, that's the area they would do it. It's not that they can't do it in free agency. If they signed Kirk Cousins tomorrow and mixed around the cap and figured it out, they would be a better football team, in my opinion. I don't think they're even comparable as quarterbacks. And it's not that I don't think that. It's that all the stats show it and all the tape shows it. And I know you agree with me on that. We both view him as an underrated quarterback, Kirk Cousins, though still not someone necessarily you can definitely pay 45 million, 50 in cap space and win a Super Bowl with, which shows how crazy it is, by the way, and how hard it is to win in the NFL. But point being, the Giants, if they want to make this thing right long term at quarterback and they have made the decision to not, let's say, restructure the Jones contract and really totally rip the Band-Aid off, Nick, and view this as a true rebuild, well, the draft is their area for doing it. Now, how do they do it in the draft, right? Nick, obviously, if the Giants had lost those games to the Patriots in Washington right now and didn't win that last game against Philly, we would look at this thing like, it's easy. This is how they do it. They have the second pick overall. They just draft Drake Mayer, Caleb Williams, or Jaden Daniels, and they call it a day. We got this. But that is not the case. The Giants don't have the second pick. They don't have the third pick. So in all likelihood, as we're starting to see, become more and more likely, Nick. You saw Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft recently. You saw Bucky Brooks's mock draft recently. Those are two guys that are plugged into the NFL. They both had quarterbacks going one, two, and three overall in their mock drafts, Nick. Both of them had that. So... 
given what we can only use to assume that quarterbacks will probably be going one, two, and three. It's been my prediction for two months now, and I'm sticking with it. If information comes forward that makes me change that, Nick, I am willing to change that. As of right now, my prediction is one, two, three QB. How do the Giants get a QB? They can do it of one of two ways. They can draft the fourth, their fourth favorite quarterback at sixth overall, assuming no one takes one at four or five, and that would even still be possible, right? Okay. Assuming that their fourth favorite quarterback is the fourth one selected too. Right. That's another thing. That's another great, great point. Or if, and if they, if he's not, you would have to assume that they have four high grades on court. Let's say they have a high grade yeah. on four quarterbacks. Let's just use that for, you can either trade up to four, then trade up to five or hope your guy falls to six, because it's not just when you do that, when you, when you're hoping your guy falls to six, you're not just hoping that the team's picking at four and five won't take that guy. You're hoping that any team in the NFL won't trade up ahead of you to four or five to take said quarterback. Now, that's your one option. Your other option is to trade up. So let's take a look at some options to them. They can, if you're the Giants and you've, let's say the Giants for argument's sake, Nick, here, do this as a three quarterback class. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying, let's say for argument's sake that they see it the way Jeremiah and Brooks and a lot of these people see it. And ultimately, Nick, I haven't decided yet and I want to watch more, but just based on eye test and traits wise, I, I I view this as three quarterbacks in a tier of their own in this class. I'm not super high on what I've seen so far from Knicks. I have a lot of questions about his arm talent. And Penix, to me, feels like a college quarterback, to be completely honest, or a guy who can be like great quarterback with a great O-line, which the Giants don't have him for him right now. And even then, you're talking about massive injury history and old age. Now, McCarthy and some of those guys are intriguing, but I'm not necessarily sure I'm not necessarily sure I'm willing to make the same bet on them as I am those first three quarterbacks. So let's say you want one of those three quarterbacks, Nick. You can either trade up to three, two, or one at that point, correct? That's the options. So let's take a look at some of previous NFL trades to try to find out what it would cost if the Giants were trying to make the move up. And then after we talk about that through Nick, I want to discuss with you your opinion on if this is something that you would be interested in the Giants doing. Because I haven't really asked you that yet this offseason. We haven't at all talked about it yet this offseason. We've said the whole time, like, oh, it would have been nice if the Giants had one of those top three picks and we would have went quarterback. But neither, neither of us have addressed would we be willing to trade the assets required. And you know there's assets that are required to actually move up and get one of these guys. So, Nick, let's go over a few trades here. The closest one that I found was unfortunately from 2001. So I want everybody to take this with a grain of salt because – Here's why I say that, Nick. In 2001, I think the trade landscape was different. There could be different trade value charts that were used. I mean, we're talking about 22 years ago. or 23 drafts ago, I think. 2020. This will be 2024 draft. 23 draft classes ago. I would guess the NFL updates their trade value chart. I'm not positive, but I would guess there are factors that have updated it. That doesn't necessarily mean, Nick, that it's going to go, that you would need to give up more or less, but it's going to be different. And so the closest thing we've seen as far as going from six to one, which is what the Giants would do to trade up with the Bears to try to get Caleb Williams or Drake May or Jaden Daniels, whoever they viewed as their QB one, would be what the Chargers and Falcons did back in 2001. So in 2001, the Chargers traded the first overall pick in the draft to the Falcons for the fifth overall pick, which is close to six. They got a 2001 third round pick back also a 2002, the next year, second round pick. They didn't even get the top of the board pick from 2001 in second round, which I thought was weird and wide receiver, Tim Dwight. So a comp would be if the giants traded sixth overall Jalen Hyatt, I, I assume at that point, Tim Dwight was probably viewed in OA GMs might view Jalen Hyatt right now, a second round pick next year from the giants and a third round pick this year from the giants. I don't know what the hell and why the hell that was all the hall was that the Chargers got back from the Falcons. And that was the victory, by the way. And the Chargers ended up taking LaDainian Tomlinson at fifth overall. But I got to imagine, Nick, that if the Giants want to do this trade to go from six to one, it's going to cost a lot more than that. Yeah, this is pretty irrelevant. Tim Dwight was like a, a very good special teams kick. How returner. did this trade ever happen? Dude, he, he was a fourth round pick who ran like a four, six, three at Iowa State. I don't know how this so trade wasn't happened, even Jalen but... Hyatt comp. That's not even a fair comp. Then it was worse. No, than that. It's no, crazy, this trade. I'll say this at least it kind of worked out for both teams. It did. The Falcons of. got it got Mike Vick. And that's the... only because they had breeze. The Falcons, well, no, not even breeze didn't even win there. They went on to rivers. You're right. It just somehow worked out for both. Well, the chargers in that same draft, if it, that was the chargers, well, they got breeze. you're they right. Got, no, they got Ladanian Tomlinson. 
But the no, with the fifth pick. And then they got Breeze yeah. in that draft too, right? They did, that was, yes. Yeah. That was 2001, I believe. And yep. Breeze was like solid there, but he had the injury issues. And then he ended up obviously going to New Orleans and they ended up getting Phil Rivers. So you have to say it ended up working out. But if that was a haul, yeah, sign me up. But of course, that's not going to be the haul. We have other precedent uh, set since then to suggest so. Yeah, and so we'll go over the trade that's been made since then, and it's a little bit different. Again, we're not going to find – we didn't find 6-1 to one with that Chargers-Falcons trade. We're not going to find it here with last year's trade either, but last year the Bears traded the number one overall pick to the Panthers who had number nine. So this is nine versus six. There's a big jump. So Nick, it's obvious based on any draft chart you look, it's a probably a range of between 200 and 250 draft value points. These are – you know, we don't know what NFL GMs use go from the sixth pick to the ninth pick, right? So the Bears traded that first pick for Carolina Panthers' ninth pick. So the Giants theoretically would give up considerably less haul. But what makes this trade interesting and hard to replicate from the Giants' standpoint, if they do make the trade with the Bears, is the Panthers gave up four draft picks, right? They gave up the ninth overall pick, a late second-round pick, 61 overall. That might be, say, the Giants' third-round pick from this year. A 2024, next year's first, right? So the Giants can give up next year's first. And then next year's second, or two years from that second. But they also gave up DJ Moore. And the thing right now is the Giants don't really have a DJ Moore on their roster to trade, right? A young player still in his mid-20s who's like a borderline wide receiver one. So that's what makes that interesting and hard to compare. Go ahead. But you got to look at the team that they're trading with. Now, the Bears needed a wide receiver to enhance Justin Fields' True. game. Now, what do the Bears need now from the New York Giants? A, a player who may be added to this deal to, to sweeten the pot. Do the Giants have a player like that? It wouldn't necessarily right. have to be a wide receiver. And it, the Bears are probably going to select a wide receiver with one of their two sure. top picks anyways. It could be a t it could be a defensive end that the Bears need, but I don't really think the Giants have that. The, the Bears aren't going to view Aziz Ojolari as anything interesting, though. If you want to get deeper with it, could it be Kayvon Thibodeau? And that's when things get really interesting. I wouldn't want to go that direction personally, most likely. And I don't think the Giants would either. But if the Giants throw that name into the mix, Nick, everything changes. Because DJ Moore versus Kayvon Thibodeau, I would imagine if you're an NFL GM, yes, DJ Moore's proven. But DJ Moore's already on his second contract, and he's older. Kayvon Thibodeau is a young, much younger than yeah. Moore on the rookie deal. That, to me, would be more valuable, in my opinion, as trading for an asset if they want to go the direction. But I don't think you can – people have said Aziz Ojolari, Nick. I don't buy that crap at all. I don't think the, the Bears are going to be looking for Aziz Ojolari after he's missed, like, every snap he's, of, of his career, essentially, and not really even proven that much. And then so – you know, that's when it starts to get interesting. What players you consider have worth or value to the Bears for what they need. I know they need a second to edge. I know that. I think they're good. They're set on tackles. Not that they would take Evan Neal anyway as any kind of like major <laughs> asset. And we have this guy. He was a top 10 pick not long ago. Yeah, Chicago, come I, doubt on, they, I doubt they, but they're good at tackle anyway. I think if they need line, it's interior offensive line. But then it gets to the interesting thing that was floated recently, at least by uh, two guys that I, that I work with, actually, Ryan Wilson from CBS sports, their main draft analyst and Emery hunt from a uh, football game plan, who, by the way, at one point did say, uh, I'm not going to get into this because everybody killed him for it. And in my opinion, he got unfairly killed for it, but you, if you know, you know, but those two had a podcast recently where they suggested a trade, which would be the giants trading the six overall pick a second round pick next year's first and a sign and trade of Saquon Barkley. So again, the six pick, this is to get up to one, the six with the bears, the six pick, a second round pick next year's first and Barkley after a sign in trade. And since that, that podcast has surfaced, I have seen, but likely bogus rumors that the bears are really interested in covet Saquon Barkley. Now Saquon Barkley could help the bears, right? They could help Justin Fields a lot. I mean, in my opinion, that would be a big, big win for the bears, but you rarely see sign in trades like this for free agent players like Barkley's going to be. And at this stage of Barkley's career, are the Bears really willing to consider him the same kind of asset as they might have considered DJ Moore last offseason, a younger player at a position that that ages considerably better than running back? I mean, every position ages better than running back. That's where I get a little skeptical, Nick. Um, but what do you what do you think around that base to move from six to one? And I guess my question to you would be, Nick, one, would you even be interested in trading up from six to one? Two, is there like a breaking point in assets or what kind of framework would you consider to make that move? So the Saquon Barkley one that Ryan Wilson laid out with Emory Hunt, yeah, I would do that deal. Now, a lot of it comes down to, A, is it realistic? Are the Bears not going to select a quarterback? 
are they actually going to roll with Justin Fields and then have to give Justin Fields a second contract, which is going to hinder your, your cap space moving forward. You right. can reset the quarterback. Clock. All that stuff has to be factored in, but let's say they are, and they're interested in this trade. Yeah. I would sign up for that trade in a second. Say Juan Barkley, we love you, but you got to go. I would investigate a lot of these trades. I, I I'm not willing to really entertain Andrew Thomas, which I don't know. Like they have tackles. They would still be interested in them, but Dexter Lawrence, I'm not really interested. Those are the two that are my no go off the trade market for sure. Those two. But honestly, man, if you have the conviction, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, if they're like, we love Drake may, we love Caleb Williams. Like this guy can set us up and we'll be a perennial super bowl contender for 15. Years. You have to do it. That's what I think. So if you actually have that conviction with anyone, are you, you, so you even, even Thomas and, and Lawrence would be in that for you or no, I think you entertain it. I, I don't want to, those would be two players that I'm going to have the conversation and do everything in my power to not include them. And if I had to include them, you're not getting nearly as much capital from a draft standpoint that you think, but I, I would like to, I would like to think that they are off limits, but I think you still entertain every scenario. If you have the conviction of those two quarterbacks, I don't know if they do have that conviction, but you're this close, man. If you think these guys can really first off from a, from a GM standpoint, from Joe Shane's standpoint, this will buy you another year, right? Same with Brian Dable might buy you another year. And if you honestly believe these guys are it, and they are going to be every year Pro Bowl type towns, Patrick Mahomes type guys. Yeah. And if you have that rapport, I think you have to freaking entertain it, man. I don't only think you have to entertain it if you think that's the case. I think you have to entertain it if you think they can be that because I don't think anyone knows what they will or won't be. And I think that's too much of a barrier for a lot of fans in, in, yeah. in roster construction. They're like, ah, there's so many busted quarterback. Ah, I can't do it. I can't do it. But it's like, if you never try to do it, how are you ever going to get it? How are you going to find the elite quarterback if you never try to do it? The you know they argue you just build the greatest roster around these guys and look at golf, look at Purdy. It's like oh great, they did it in a year where there's not a single elite quarterback in the NFC. How long is that going to last, guys? How long is it going to last? Because we already know in the other conference, if you don't have Mahomes or Allen, you're not going or, or Lamar, you're not really going anywhere in that conference. Really, you're in trouble. And now Stroud, you can throw him into the mix maybe and Burrow. Maybe. And Burrow, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, it's it's a crazy gauntlet there. there. It's a gauntlet there. But we know that that conference has the elite QBs. Are you just to assume the NFC is not going to have an elite quarterback for the next 10 years? That's a terrible assumption to make. We don't know. It could be as early as this year if one of these draft guys works out and they go to Washington, for example. We just don't know. And so I think you're better off not trying to make that assumption. You're trying to take these chances to find that quarterback. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do it now. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Think about it this way, too. Who's picking number two? Washington. That's the Washington. The Washington commanders are picking number two. You get these guys in the room, Drake May, Caleb Williams. Let's focus on those two specifically. You want to trade up to ensure that you get your guy. If you think Washington's going to get that guy, you're going to have to be playing that guy twice. If you have that much conviction again, man, if you, if you really True. believe this guy is the next Justin Herbert, if he's the next Joe Burrow, if he's the next Patrick, go down the list. And say, if you have a higher grade on Caleb Williams over Drake May or Drake May over Caleb Williams. And one of those guys might, fall in your division that even gives you more of a reason sure. to trade up and get them. That's a good point. And the way I look at it, Nick, you know, I don't want to, I'll entertain it because I'm at the point, Nick, where I just want hope for this franchise. And the only way I see personally see hope for this franchise is via the quarterback position. You can disagree with me. It's my opinion. I'm allowed to have to, I'm t talking to anybody else. I know where you stand on this, Nick, but for those who disagree, it's fine. Don't get so combative about it. Don't get mad at me for this take. It's just an opinion. And my opinion is there's no long-term ceiling of being a Super Bowl contending team on a consistent basis with Daniel Jones at quarterback. I need something else to be that quarterback. And, and so to me, I'll be honest with you, Nick, there's almost no price to pay that I'd be mad at them for trading up. I'd be excited almost no matter what, because I would know that we would have a chance to actually get one of these quarterbacks. And in my lifetime, Nick, we've never had that opportunity. You can say 2019, but to both of us, we had a second round grade on Jones. We didn't feel like we were drafting an elite prospect. In 2004, I was alive for that when they had Eli, but I wasn't really following the draft the same way. And, sit, and, and to be honest, this is a big reason why myself and a lot of fans weren't necessarily saying every win was a great win this year, because without those wins, we actually would have been in position to get an elite yeah. talent at quarterback without trading up. So to me, there's not a price that would make me go crazy. I hate Joe Shane. How did he do this trade? I can't believe it. We're so screwed because my mind would immediately go to the hope and the optimism and the upside of what that quarterback can come up. That doesn't mean he's going to become that, but it would go to that route. 
now with that said, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah. So just don't get strong armed because it's easy to include a lot of right. those future picks and go up and get your guy. And I really want you to investigate it. But to me, Andrew Thomas and Dexter Lawrence, those two, while you can entertain it, those two are worth more than a first round value. I agree. Both of them. They're proven commodities. They are all pros. They young. are great. They're young, great building block players. So if they were to be included in the trade, I don't know if you're giving up, you know, the second round, then the third round, and maybe a, that sub. That I don't even know if you have to give up a future one at that point. That, that's my point. Like, don't don't get strong armed into that. That's not DJ Moore. Right? No, like, that that's is not way DJ better Moore. than DJ. It's Moore. Way better than DJ Moore. So I want to make that clear. You can entertain it, but man, you're giving up significant. And I wouldn't do Thomas almost no matter what, Nick, because yeah, I don't know you if need I him to block. You need exactly. Him. You need, yeah. and I don't. Dex, at we're least, just, at least, yeah, we're ahead. just setting parameters for sure. what what should be entertained and discussed. And to me, the most important thing, and I know that you agree with this, in the NFL is having a quarterback that gives you the opportunity to compete year in and yes. year out. And the Giants haven't had that since Eli Manning. No, they haven't had that since Eli Manning. And if they get it in the draft, Nick, they get it also for five years cheap, cheap under the cap. So you can really build out around them and spend a ton of cap space. And now, eventually, the goal would be to find a quarterback who, once you pay him that second contract, you could still win with, a la Mahomes, Allen. And I know people are, you know, there are different opinions on the Allen situation, but it's like, dude, have you actually watched the day? Nah, he's a stud. I don't it's care. Just, it's pathetic. But, um, you know, those guys that you can win with once you pay them. But for now, you would also get the rookie deal out of it, which is great for any team. I mean, if you hit like right now where the Texans are at with Stroud, dude, they're going to start Amazing. unloading. They're going to start unloading via trades for big contracts, free agent contracts. They're going to just unload because they don't have no, they have no reason not to. They have so much cap space because this guy who's an amazing quarterback on their team is only allocated 9 million in cap space while people like the Giants are allocating 47 million to Daniel Jones, right? And so that's what you can get. But as far as the trade up for me goes and what I, I'll be happy almost no matter what, but I won't be happy if Andrew Thomas is involved because I don't think it's easy to get a left tackle. And I think it's so necessary for a quarterback to have a left tackle. Dexter. We know that's that it's not easy to get a tackle. It's not. Yeah. We know more than we anything. know that <laughs> it's not easy to get a tackle. We've tried. We tried at nine, seven overall. We tried at 99 overall with paired. It didn't work. It tried with Eric after. flowers. It's yeah. we tried with Eric flowers at six over whatever that 11 overall, whatever that was. And no, I think it was nine overall. Um, but, and, and the jury's still out on Neil for me. Hopefully an offensive line coach can fix Neil. I'm not totally against that, but you move down the line. Thomas to me personally is a no go. I would rather just kick the, kick it down the line and just hope we can get in position to draft an elite guy at some point outside of this year. Dexter becomes interesting. I still think I'm leaning toward no, he shouldn't be included at all, but it does get interesting at that point. But what really gets interesting to me, Nick is gave on Thibodeau. Because I love Kayvon, but I don't love him nearly as much as I love Dexter Lawrence or Thomas. I don't even have him in the same tier as those two players right now. So that's when it gets interesting. Because if you float that as Joe Shane, you're floating insane asset that has not really ever been floated in a trade like this. Like, it's not comparable to DJ Moore, even in my opinion. I think he's a better asset and should require, you know, should garner more back than a DJ Moore. Personally, I know DJ Moore is a proven player and he's still pretty young. But Kayvon Thibodeau was a you know, blue chip type prospect who's still on his rookie deal and much younger and could develop into a player that we don't know. So that's when it starts to get interesting. But what I would also say with regards to this is something you mentioned a little bit earlier. I feel confident that Joe Shane won't get strong arm. I feel confident that Joe Shane won't be the type of GM that says, I don't care what I have to do. I got to get this player. I got to make this pick and I got to get my quarterback for my franchise. Now, the former GM the Giants used to have, you know for damn sure he would have got hoodwinked in a trade because you've seen it already. He traded B.J. Hill for a center who's out of the league right now, you know, and that was only one of the trades. He traded for Alec Ogletree, then extended him, and he's out of the NFL and was all, like time after time after time after time. And again, did that guy make bad decisions and bad trades, and even though the Beckham trade was, in a, was working out as a good one for him? He hit that one. But other than that, you know he wouldn't do it. But I don't think Joe Shane's going to get strong arm next, so I'm not as worried about that. Um, but outside of Kayvon and, and you know, the next that you would give up from a pick standpoint, where would there be a draft capital that that would just blow you out of the water, Nick, to the point where you're like, I'm now angry. And I'm not saying you wouldn't be like intrigued. I'm saying you'd be angry if they made I get it. it. Yeah. So yeah. probably three ones and multiple twos or something. Okay. Because there's going to be some bidders, man. It's not just going to be yeah. the Giants who are interested in selecting or the That's opportunity the to select Drake May and Caleb Williams. Like the Bears are in such a good situation. Like they, like Ryan Poles, like, bro, 
thank God you wanted Bryce Young. Thank God you wanted him. And he ended up sucking and your team was a disaster. And you fired your coach, Carolina Panthers, because now I own your pick and I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And I have my pick for my own shitty franchise or I can go and say, like, I would love being a Bears fan at the moment. But yeah, so I would say like three firsts and and multiple seconds, like c- completely removing the Giants from the draft conversation through 2026 would be something where I'm like, ah. and I'm also uh, in love with the draft process. So deep right. down, even it like be trading so bad for us, you're right. Yeah. God, even like trading next year's first, like I'll accept it, but there's going to be that little part of me. That's like, man, I love going over first round prospects. I know. Like, oh, and we wouldn't even have one. <laughs> no, but uh, I am, um, but I, I'm willing to make to trade up. I am. I'm yeah. willing to entertain that idea. I think you have to be aggressive and you have to get your guy if they love their guy. And that's really what it comes down to. I just don't want you to get strong armed and really Andrew Thomas, Dexter Lawrence, include him in the conversations, but Holy shit, dude, don't, don't do anything too crazy. <laughs> yeah. And you said earlier that you would love being a bears fan right now. I'll, I'll tell you my opinion on that. I would only love being a bears fan. If I got the news that they're taking Caleb Williams or Drake may or, or Jimmy yeah. Daniels. I would not be loving a bears fan. If we decided to go forward with just Fields. I know I'd get a great haul back for it, but God, I mean, I'd be so disappointed from what I've seen from field so far. Like it just strikes me as like the team making that Oh, the locker room loves him. We won some games at the end of the year. Let's make it work around him. When we give him all that, I would just rather get the talent. And I don't even think fields is comparable from a talent standpoint to Caleb Williams personally. Now, the other question is from a bitter standpoint, you have uh, go ahead. What were you going to say first? I was just going to say, man, if someone could could really unlock Justin Fields though from like a physical talent standpoint, oh, from there physical, are, yes. There, there's really few quarterbacks who have his physical talent. It's I agree. just it's just getting the right maybe quarterback coach, getting the right offense around him, and have, possible though, Do you think having him process at at a different level. That's right? the thing because he has kind of that Daniel Jones thing going on. Where, yeah. Oh yeah. But he when does. you watch Justin Fields throw the football, like I could watch Justin Fields throw the football all day. I can watch Justin Fields try to get the edge all day. All day. He's yeah. so freaking exciting. So at least that's, that's the thing: is arm talent is very underrated. Oh, it's 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 up there, bro. It's up it there. Is. And people don't realize yeah. that. Now, now, my question for you would be, Nick: Do you back yourself into a a corner that you can't get out of when you say, if we could get the right coach, if we could do this, we can unlock the processing part? Because this goes uh, back I mean, to I'm, my whole. Thing. I'm selecting one of my favorite quarterback from Drake Mayer. That's what I'm doing. If no, I'm I know that's what you would do, yeah. but I'm saying if that's the route the Bears went. Are they falling into a trap? Because I almost feel like it's a trap because I, I'm not convinced that processing is something that can be improved on with good coaching. I think it can look better and you can make it look better for a little short period of time. Kind of like Brian Dable did with Daniel Jones in 2022. You can mask this thing. You could throw a lot of lipstick on the pig, but is the processing more natural? Is it innate? And we've had this conversation with quarterbacks before and quarterback coaches, and it, it's been closer to 50, 50. I think actually it's been closer to the lean of you have it or you don't, and it's innate. But I, I am on a stronger lean. I'm, where I'm at with this whole, Nick, just from what we've learned over the last 10 years and all the people we've discussed this with, over the last five years, I should say, I'm more of the you either have it or you don't when it comes to processing. You either see the field good post-snap or you don't. I think pre-snap is where you can get better. I do think you can start to get better pre-snap. And it is concerning to me that Daniel Jones has not made a lot of uh, progress pre-snap considering how hard of a worker he is and how smart he's supposed to be and all the studying we hear. Pre-snap, I think, can be improved. But post-snap, how you see that field, that I don't know. Like, Did you see any hard knocks this year with with the, with the helmet view of what Tua had? They, they had a no. cool helmet view from practice. And it's fast, man. The bullets are flying. It looks hard to see the field as a quarterback. I think you kind of either have that, you know, ability to do the quick math in your head fast or you don't. And I don't know how much can be improved. So I'd be very scared personally. If I just hired Shane Waldron, the great former, yeah, Seattle Seahawks coordinator who revitalized Geno Smith's career. So there could be something there, right? And it looks like he got something out of lock, by the way. <laughs> got something on a lock and I don't know where Shane Waldron is at, but those conversations are going to happen. I would want to reset the rookie clock and bring in one of the rookies, but I don't think it's a, a given where you're just like, yep, yeah, Justin Fields, he's done because you see the talent. You at least right. want to have those. Cause what kind of haul are you going to get? You're going to get a huge haul, huge haul, huge haul for that. pick. You could double trade it too. You could go from one to two with Washington. So Washington gets the quarterback they want. Ultimately, if the bears trade, I believe they will trade from one to two and then two again, back down with another team. And you could go from one to two and then two to six with the giants. Potentially. You and could treat you like you're get? in a Madden franchise, right? Like you're in a Madden franchise. You're like, oh, I'll just trade one pick back, one pick back. Oh, one pick and back. by the way, Nick, Ryan Poles already admitted to the public that that's what they tried to do last year. And they did kind of, I mean, they traded from nine to 10 with the Eagles. So the Eagles could get Jalen Carter. And then they, they picked up a little bit there, but you can do it from one to two and 
you know, be honest, if you go from one to two with Washington, you could leverage that to Washington saying, look, I know it's only two to one, but if you don't make this trade, we're going to do it with team X, team Y, team Z. And then you don't get your quarterback. So that you're one you want. Let's say it's Caleb. So now they move from one to two Chicago and then from two to six with the Giants, let's say, or two to anything with any other team, you can get another massive, you get a bigger, even bigger hole probably going two to yeah. six down. Now you're picking sixth overall. You're still getting a blue chip prospect and you have all these picks. It's interesting. It's interesting. And, and say it's the Atlanta, not the worst idea. Say the Atlanta Falcons. I know we're spending way too much time on the Bears here, but say yeah. the, but it's, it's pertinent, right? The Atlanta Falcons could be like, hey, we'll give you a two or two twos or whatever for Justin Fields. Maybe sure. they'll even give a one in the right. future or something like that for Justin. And now you have the Bears just just keeping their first overall pick, selecting the guy they want. Then they have, what, the eighth or ninth, whatever they have after. And now you have another pick to right. add into the equation. They're in a good spot. They're in a good spot. They're in a very good spot. And it does intrigue me a little bit as far as keeping fields. It gives me at least a little drawback if I were the Bears. But the, it's, the reason we're discussing so much Bears is because of this next part of our conversation, which is how else can the Giants improve uh, address the quarterback position? If it's not with one with the Bears, Nick? Is it happening? Two is Washington. Three is New England. Both teams need quarterbacks. Are either teams willing to trade? This has always been the discussion. Everyone says, don't worry about draft position. Don't you worry about winning these games against these bad teams at the end of the season. Because if you're really like a guy, you have a conviction, you can always trade up. That's not the case. You can only trade up if there's a willing partner. It takes two to tango on these draft trades. Everyone who says that doesn't acknowledge the reality of the situation, which is if you want to make this trade, the other team has to be willing to do it. So I'm going to throw out the idea of three overall, Nick, because I think it's a much better chance that the Patriots are willing to trade their pick than Washington. I'll just give a quick recap as to why Washington has new ownership. Washington has good ownership and Washington has a new coaching staff coming in. I think it's going to be Lions offense coordinator, Ben Johnson. That to me screams quarterback, no matter what, I don't even want to entertain any other idea. Now three with new England, they also need a quarterback, but they're also not doing new ownership, right? They are doing a new head coach. They're not doing new ownership or they have Jared Mayo. And that's a franchise, Nick, that has previously believed in trading back and believed in the idea of acquiring all these assets. And, you know, the draft is a crapshoot. So what? let's not overvalue picks. Let's try to get more picks. So they, to me, are a more intriguing trade partner for the Giants from six to three. If the Giants do love three quarterbacks, which they may not, the Giants may only like May and Williams. We don't know. The Giants may not be willing to make that trade for Jaden Daniels, or they may only like Daniels and Williams, and they may not be willing to make that trade up for May. We don't know. but. Let's talk about what it could take to go from six to three. And I know you looked up the Jets trade because that's a good one yeah. that we have. It was just three second round picks back in 2018. So the Jets could trade up and get Sam Darnold with the Indianapolis Colts who selected Quentin Nelson at six. Now, if the Giants look to do this. They have an extra second round pick this year with the Seattle Seahawks. So you would trade both of their second round picks and then next year's second round pick. And if I haven't studied Jane Daniels yet, and assuming that Jane Daniels is not selected with the first two picks, would that be worth it? Maybe the giants feel like he is the guy again, that conviction, then yes, you go and do that for three twos. That's an easy one for me to accept. I just don't know if the Patriots would accept that. Sure. It depends on if they want the quarterback or not, you know, it's a, and that's the point. What you just said, Nick, it takes two to tango. We don't know if these teams, and that's why it kind of sucks how it shook out, right? If the Cardinals had the second or third pick, I think it's a better chance of happening because they've kind of made it clear they want to stay with Kyler Murray. But the teams that ended up two and three, it really sucks at Washington, by the way. Is the oh, the that's, the one that, one that's the one that pisses me off the most. You guys want to talk about how fun it was sweeping Washington. Enjoy it at the time. I did too, but let's be honest. Looking back now, results-wise, it's not great. It's not great that Washington is picking at two and the Giants are picking at six. It's just not great. So now we got to move on, though, a little bit. Let's talk about second round. Because we've yep. seen teams in recent history hit with second round quarterbacks. The, the most, um, the one that comes to mind the most would be Jalen Hurts in the Philadelphia Eagles. So, or Drew Brees, if we're counting that. I mean, if we're going back that far, you yeah. have like Andy Dalton. It's with a different team, yeah. too. Yeah. There's a lot of second round quarter, Derek Carr, Colin Kaepernick. But I don't consider those any on. hits. Now I'm talking, you either get your elite guy. I'm at the you point. You're talking about elite, dude. Yeah, I'm at the point. Was Jalen Hurts grouped in there or no? I wouldn't, but. See? Yeah, it gets interesting. Well, that's what really gets interesting because like it really goes to show like you want elite talent, you pretty much have to get at the top of the draft, but you can try to get it otherwise and you can randomly hit on Brady's occasionally, but like occasionally is not really occasionally. It's rarely, um, but 
you know, I don't consider Dalton. Like I'm past the point of going for the Dalton and car ceiling type quarterbacks. Like Jones was like that to me doesn't work because once you have to give them the second contract, you're have no chance to really compete consistently for Super Bowls because they're taking up 47 million in cap space and they're not good that good. So second round, it's interesting to me, Nick, but I will say this. This is my take for a while. I'm curious to get your take on this. I had this argument, I think, in a giant space a little while ago with our buddy Sal, who believes that Maybe. there's enough quarterback talent in class, uh, talent in this class that the Giants should have a conviction on anything that falls to them essentially at six, which I disagreed with. I think you should only take a quarterback at six if you believe he has elite upside and elite traits. But to me, Nick, if those three quarterbacks are off the board that I see, Daniels, May, and, and Williams, I'm not so sure I see such a big difference between the rest of the guys. So to me, if you take one at the top of round two versus taking one at six, you may not be getting that much of a drop off in your eyes and in your evaluation. Or let's say you don't even take one in round two. Let's throw this into the mix because we haven't discussed this possibility. What if you leverage your round two picks to trade back into round one and get a quarterback at the back end of round one where you still get his fifth year rookie option? To me, that's not necessarily so different than what they would get at six at quarterback if the big three go off the board, one, two, and three. So I'm actually better off. Like I would much rather go quarterback end of round one after trading up or beginning of round two than I would at six if one of those three is, if all of those three are off the board, I think. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think that's the that's the path that you want to take to get that quarterback. And again, you're getting that fifth year option still. You trade both your twos, maybe another pick a little bit later. Now, I don't see just from again, have to watch the all 22, a huge difference either between a lot of those the Penixes and the Bo Nixes right. and the JJ McCarthy's. So maybe you can get that guy at 30 or whatever, and you could trade back. So I, I'm definitely open to that. But we should go over if we're done with this section one more course of action that Free we've agency. seen teams. Yep. We've seen teams in recent history, the Indianapolis Colts, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, have a lot of success finding quarterbacks through free agency on cheap deals. You can even argue the New York Giants with Tyrod Taylor yes. to some degree. And I wish Tyrod Taylor was returning to the New York Giants because I do believe in his in his game. I just think he's he's injury prone because he just kind of subjects himself to, to big ass hits. Right. But there are some quarterbacks who are going to be free agents, Dan, who are interesting who can fall into this bucket, who can allow Daniel Jones to maybe still start, but can maybe push Daniel Jones if they're actually operating in a meritocracy, which we mm -hmm. gave Brian Dable credit for that in the Kenny Galladay situation with David Sills back in 2023. Now, the quarterback is a much different uh, much different um, um, reality there. It's a much different situation, obviously. But a couple names that come to mind, if you exclude Tyrod Taylor, you have Sam Darnold. You have Gardner Minshew. Those are two that really kind of jumped out to me. Josh Dobbs is going to be a free agent. Joe Flacco, which starts to get a little weird, right? But Joe Flacco had success this year, did help his team get to the playoffs. And Jameis Winston. So you have some names there, right? Some some guys who aren't terrible. Ryan Tannehill, too. I just don't know how much he's going to want or if you know he might be over the hill to a little bit longer in the tooth than, than what we're expecting. But Ryan Tannehill is also athletic. And he can he can operate uh, the mobile passing attack and the rollouts and the things that Brian Dable like to do with Daniel Jones under center. So there are some guys there who from who from the list that I just said interests you the most. <laughs> it's, I, I almost feel like it's Tyrod Taylor, but I mean, other than that, let's say it's, it's a not... cheaper contract, sub ten million a year. Sure. Okay. I'll go to a different route. I'll go with Russell Wilson. Not that I have that much hope Ooh, that Russell Wilson okay. can get back to what he was, but out of the guys you mentioned, it's slim Pickens, man. Like I'm not a huge Gardner Minshew fan. I guess you could throw him in the mix and I think he would compete. But the fact of the matter is like, if they don't go the draft route, they are going to go one of these free agents. Right. I mean, but it comes before the draft, obviously, but that's the interesting part too. Right. Like what are the, that's a, that's the big interesting part too. Like what will the giants free agent, what they do in free agency at quarterback spell anything to us about what their plan is at quarterback in the draft. I wonder if that's the case, but I don't know if I find anything intriguing outside of potentially trying to revive Russ. I like the revival of Russ as, as an option. Again, it would have to be, you know, cheap. And I just cheap. think, Oh, that'd him, be real cheap. I just think he is a little bit more pricey than the guys that I named, but one player that, uh, that interests me and he has similar issues to Daniel Jones. So I'm not looking, you know, I don't have delusions of grandeur that he's going to come in and, and be the long-term quarterback. It's more just push Jones for the 2024 season. Hopefully they add a rookie as well. And not just push Jones, just to, to, to jump in real quick. Also to be insurance because Jones has been injured a lot, all but one yes. year, right? Yeah. Yes. What about Sam Darnold? I'm intrigued by it. 
Look, he's 27 years old. Yeah, he's 27 years old, sucked with Adam Gase, has his issues. Footwork was an absolute mess, but you are pairing him with Brian Dable. And again, you're not looking for a guy who's going to take you to the Super Bowl. You're not going to find that guy on for eight. You're looking for upside. That's what you're looking for. Sam Darnold has upside. And if you do pair him with Brian Dable, we saw him have, I don't know if success is the right way to term it. I really don't know, but he was good in preseason with Kyle Shanahan. Could he come in and be a decent stretch of the Panthers last year? He had a decent stretch with the Panthers. And again, that Panther situation is hard to read, right? Because Baker Mayfield had a, I would say, okay time with the Panthers, but relative to what a lot of people expected, it blew up, right? He had a couple good games, but it blew up in their face. The Giants beat them, right? 2023. But then he goes to the Rams, stabilizes a little bit, learns under someone similar to Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay, and then ends up going to Tampa Bay and leading the Buccaneers to the playoffs against a lot of odds in in a weak division, but still. Baker Mayfield, that was a success for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Could Sam Darnold come in here? And first off, I don't even know if the Giants would, would I would hope they would add somebody to challenge Daniel Jones, but I don't know. Like, I, I just don't know with John Mayer. I'm, I'm hoping that they right. do. I think that's at least an interesting name if they're not going to bring back Tyrod, which I'm very interested in bringing back Tyrod, obviously. Yeah, I would prefer Tyrod, obviously, there. Um, but I will say this. I don't know if Tyrod wants to come back here because if you're Tyrod Taylor, and you're looking at the Giants and free agency this year, and they tell you, you can resign with us, but Jones is the unquestioned QB1. I don't know if you could look yourself in the mirror and be like, ah, I saw what happened on tape. I was arguably better than Jones was on tape. I was certainly better as a passer. That's not even questionable. And again, I know I had Andrew Thomas, but I mean, you're looking at it like, do I really get to come back to this? I don't even have a chance to beat the starter out. And that would be the interesting thing if the Giants are willing to give any of these friends a chance to compete, at least. Not saying they're going to beat out Jones, but at least prove that maybe you can beat out Jones in camp or you may be the better option for the Giants. And I don't know if Taylor will feel that way, Nick. It's interesting. But Darnold is intriguing based on his age and arm talent. I just think that he's got some issues with his game that are, are maybe unfixable. Maybe. I don't know. You bring him with Brian Dable. Maybe he can improve himself. It's it's tough to say. Um, Russ, I don't think he's going to cost that much, Russ. I think he's done from a cost standpoint. Like I think he's got to face a reality that like he's failed at this point with two teams and he made a lot of money anyway with the Broncos because the contract they resigned. Him to. Yeah. And he's so, also married to Sierra. Right. Does the money matter? Might, well, no, not just that, but no. there's a lot of appeal in being in the New York area. Oh, right. Someone with superstardom. So he might want to play for a team like the Jets or a team like the Giants. And if Aaron Rodgers is with the Jets and you look over at the Giants and you're like, well, Daniel Jones tor- torn ACL and Russell Wilson. But again, it goes back to, is that the path that John Mara and Joe Shane are going to take? Which basically says if they bring in someone like Russell Wilson, it's like, yeah, Daniel Jones, you really have to compete for this job. Good luck. Yes. Whereas Sam Darnold, you can argue like yep. it's Daniel Jones's job, but you know, we'll keep Here's our insurance. Eyes. Yeah, exactly. With some upside that we can develop. Right. But I don't know if it's fair to just be like, that's all we need right now. Some insurance with a little bit of upside. Not, Jones has been not. terrible on tape. Like, and he's injured all the time. You need to bring real comp at this point. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, we can bring in real competition for this dude at this stage of his career. But has ownership drank that glass of reality? Right. Yet? That's the question. Yes. Uh, they've drank that glass of reality. I don't know if that's the answer. Uh, the answer to that question. I do know that, you know, ESPN had that sourced article last year that said the Giants are one of the teams in the mix for trading for Russell Wilson. So I know there was some interest at some point there. I mean, and now it's the cheapest you're going to be able to get him. I honestly don't think he's going to sign a big deal with whoever signs him. Um, ultimately, I think maybe Atlanta will make that move. We'll see what happens there. Um, it'll be intriguing. I don't know what he has left in him, Russ Wilson, but I know that he'd be an interesting competition. I mean, he actually had a pretty decent year this year before he got benched, which is weird. Like if you look at the numbers, let's take a look at these Russell Wilson numbers. First off, you know what? I think we should really do the hard hitting yeah. journalism here. <laughs> What's that? Look, it was uh, Go Hawks, <coughs> Seattle. It was Broncos country, Liz Rad. What is it if he signs with the New York Giants? Yeah, exactly. What I don't uh, know what it would go be. Go big or go home, like for the Giants. Like, I, I'm not sure. There's got to be something like that, though. Something Russell Wilson, point. this past year, by the way, had a 66.4% completion rate, 26 touchdowns, and just eight interceptions this past year. It's not like he was that horrifically bad this past year like those yeah. are fine he didn't even play the whole year he was benched in that toward the end and, of the and that year. situation was really odd with sean payton and sure. the contract and guarantees yeah. and things of that nature and i think those numbers were better than what he actually was on tape like i don't think he was as good as those numbers the tape may be a little worse i didn't watch him on tape and obviously he got you know he's gonna they're moving on from him largely because of the contract i think they don't want to allocate that money to a player like him anymore and i don't think he fit great with that locker room that's the other side of russell like i don't know if he's the leader the giants want at all but That's if you're looking point. at potential, what'd you say? 
it's a good point. Yeah. But if you're looking at potential, just like what can the Giants do if they can't, if the draft is out of the picture because they have the six pick and they're all gone and they don't really love any other guys, it's at least someone who has won before and I think could push Jones potentially based on what Jones has shown lately on tape. But it's something we'll consider for sure. And it's something what, as far as what the Giants will do if they go, don't go the draft route. And it'll be interesting to see. There's a couple other names that I want to throw out there. Not, not None of whom I'd really be all that interested in, but Jacoby Brissett, um, Tyler Huntley, who at one point there was some intrigue around him. He had a decent stretch with the Ravens. I'm not a huge Huntley guy either, Nick. Yes. Um, and again, Dan and I are talking about just for 2024. This is yes. not a long-term solution. No. So please don't like be like, oh my God, you did shine jam darn. No, okay. <laughs> we're looking for this is no. we're ripping that band-aid off and we need somebody to compete. In 2024, hopefully the Giants will take steps to actually get a young quarterback between now and then, their actual quarterback of the future, hopefully in this draft. But that's part of it for Nick and I, too, because Nick and I are not of the belief of jam quarterback because you need quarterback. That's in what the happened draft. in 2019, right? Because that's what happened in 2019, and look what it got us. We don't view it this way. So there are this is what happens to a lot of NFL franchises. They don't get themselves in a position to ever upgrade quarterback in the draft, and it gets tricky, and it gets tough, and it gets even more difficult in those scenarios. And the Giants are kind of in that scenario right now with the sixth overall pick in this draft and three teams drafting one, two, three that need quarterbacks. It's kind of the reality of the situation. So, you know, I, I'm not saying you should change your opinion as far as if you think it's fair for fans to not necessarily want wins and loss seasons, but at least use this as information to reconsider that maybe there's at least some, you know, they, you have your mindset and that's fine, but at least, you know, entertain other people's mindsets as to why they don't want those wins in seasons like the last one, when the playoffs are done and you're facing the worst teams in the league, like new England and Washington teams are going to be competing with you for that draft pick. And when you need a quarterback, so it's, it's at least worth considering, I think as to why, and I'm not saying that changes anything again, I'm never saying the Giants should tank. Players don't tank. They're trying to feed their families. Coaches are trying to keep their jobs. Yeah. It's obvious. But just from a results-based standpoint, I think it's pretty clear we'd rather have the second pick than the sixth right now, wouldn't we? I mean, that one's obvious. And so, you know, that's really the only way I think the Giants will get back to a quarterback. But maybe they trade up in this draft, or maybe they view this as not the draft for the quarterback. All this is still in the mix, Nick, which is why we discussed every avenue or we tried to at least today. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. It is the number one burning question in our series of the biggest face uh, questions facing the Giants this offseason. How to address quarterback if they even want to address quarterback or if they want to continue down the Jones path and restructure that contract, kick back some cap hit and just move forward trying to build around him. All those questions will be answered this offseason. I'm excited to see what happens. And I'm excited to see how the Giants go about it, especially because free agency comes before the draft, Nick. So whatever happens at quarterback in free agency could also really impact what they're going to do in the draft. Like, you know, if they sign a big free agent quarterback or something. So it's a lot in the mix here. We'll have to see what happens here, Nick. But thanks, everybody, tuning into the Big Blue Bander podcast. You will hear us again with the second part of our series, the next biggest question facing the Giants franchise this offseason. Uh, other than that, we have more content coming your way. Please make sure you subscribe and download. Uh, please make sure if you're watching on YouTube, you hit like and subscribe. These are all things we're going to need from you and we want from you. Other than that, have a great rest of your night and we'll talk to you soon. Giants country. Keep growing. <laughs> That's the one.